some of you sitting in here now may not think it applies, but after we get done today, probably will. And those out there in CD land who listen to this may not think it applies until after you hear it. And such is the Word of God that is alive and active. And it cuts open stuff. And it reveals. In order that we may uh, purify our souls in obeying the truth. So, we're going to look at a a couple of things. Uh, one, the, I guess the, the heart of the matter where we'll get down into the center of it is going to have to do with a, a, a mother teaching her son and the effects on that son and how initially it really doesn't come down to so much as what somebody is taught, but is what somebody believes. It doesn't matter who does the teaching. And so it applied then with Bathsheba and Solomon, and it applies today. And when we get down here, you're probably not even going to associate that... Uh, Solomon was being talked about here because of, he's called by a different name, which most people don't realize this. And you may or may not, in your translation, have a footnote that that's who's being spoke to. I don't, you know, I don't know what's in front of you, but um, the greatest thing today is looking back is not acceptable. Not at any time. And it doesn't matter whether that's positive or negative. Because we're going to see through the life of uh, Solomon to where <clears throat> back could be one of the most positive influences you've ever experienced in your life. And if you don't move on from that, then you can get stuck there, and, and I and I and I don't I don't find anything in here where it says stay in the campground. If you get to a certain campground, you spend the night, but then you move on. It is an admonition over and over and over again to move on, and so. Forget what was behind, positive or negative, no matter what it was in your life. Or what you did. Forget it. And the word press that we're going to read here in the translation that I'm reading out of is systematically pursued. In other words, it's, it's not just a fly-by-night deal. It's a systematic pursuit of getting to the full maturity of being like Christ. So it's not, a shot, it's not a shot in the dark thing. It's not something that, oh, I'll be like, think I'll be like Christ today. That's not a systematic pursuit. That would make about as much sense as me farming for the last 33 years and just get up and say, well, okay, sarah, sarah, they would just be what today is. I've seen a lot of farmers like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not a systematic pursuit. So as we glean from the scriptures today, uh, these teachings unto life. Uh, my prayer is that it'll remove a burden and destroy a yoke in your life, because some of you is just holding on to the past, and I and I don't, and I don't care how big or little it is. It's not acceptable. It's not acceptable, 
And if you choose to consistently stay there, then you are in rebellion to the will of God for you and your life. That's the fact. So, decree a thing today, make a decision, and it will be established to move on, to forget whether last year, last month, whatever, was the greatest or the most negative. I don't care what your failures was. See, for you to stay in the negative or even to stay in the positive. Well, I, I, I blew it. Well, if you stay there, then you're saying where sin abounded, grace didn't much more abound. So you're making a mockery of grace, which that's a, that's a biggie. Most people want to camp out because it's nothing more than a pity party. They, they just want to sit and pout. Even if you blew it by your own wrong decisions. Forget it. Forget it. Again, to dwell on and to camp out on, you're saying His grace is not sufficient. I, I, know, I know some of that other stuff out there. Yeah, that, that works, but no. No, you're right. No. Move on. Philippians 3. Oh, and we'll actually start where it's written. <laughs> Rather than I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Reaching forward to those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which is Christ's likeness. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect. Now, here are some words that people just, as many, which means this doesn't include all. So basically, Paul is addressing a group of people, but not all are going to get this. Just the mature ones will. As many as be fully matured, perfect, perfect, be thus minded. In other words, those of you reading this, and you have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about, then you be like-minded with me right now in this. Those within the congregation that are still stumbling and, and having issues or whatever, then get them perfected. Bear their burden. It's time to stop hanging out where you are. And if anything, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, Otherwise minded than this fully mature, this fully perfection process in Christ. Let God even reveal this unto you. See, Paul's doing what you're supposed to do in teaching the Scripture. He's making information available in order for the Spirit of God to bring forth understanding. Paul realized, I can't do this. <clears throat> Otherwise, he's subjugating the Holy Spirit, which that's a big one too. But that's the mantra of the modern church today. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Again, this is referring back to Previous verse of being fully matured, being perfect. Let us mind the same thing. Let us understand that our goal is being Christ-like. Our goal is to walk as Christ walked. Our goal is to be fully perfected, fully matured. Brethren, be fathers, followers together of me, and mark those which walk so as you have us for an example. 
For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, because this is a serious matter in the church, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. These God followers, this majority of people who profess religion, profess God, are enemies of the cross. They're enemies of the grace of God. They're enemies of this perfection in Christ. They're enemies of this dispensation that we now live in. That's all said in that one little tidbit. And these people who are walking that way, what? Their end is destruction. Why? This translation says, whose God is their belly. Better way to have translated this is self-willed person. As long as the will of God is not too tough to follow, I'll walk in it. But if it gets too tough for me, then I'm going to change theology around a little bit and make whatever I'm doing acceptable not only to me, but to God. Thus you have the modern church. So, if your self-will to be able to do what you want to do is more important, then your end is destruction. I'm not telling you that. I'm just reading you that. That's what it says. And this book also says his word is truth. And his truth is a shield. His truth is a shield. Not deception. Whose glory is in their shame. Because they mind earthly things. They're carnal. They're fleshly. They speak, about Christ, they speak about church things, but their entire life is carnal. It's earthy. All you have to do to discern that is listen to a conversation with anybody. Everything that comes out of their mouth is earthy. It has no spirituality to it whatsoever. It, it doesn't matter. Everything is connected to the earth. Everything. Every explanation is connected to the earth. There, there's, not a, there's not a supernatural force going on. There's not anything to where God is in control, especially their own situation. If there's trouble in the house, sickness in the it doesn't really matter. It's earthy. And he's reminding them our citizenship is in heaven from where also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change this vile body in the resurrection that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working. The working was what he did in the resurrection in overcoming death whereby he was able even to subdue all things unto himself and all leaves nothing out. For you to say that you can't overcome, that you can say that you can't forget what lies behind, that you can't systematically pursue, that somehow or another your circumstances are different, that's unbelief. You just simply do not believe God. It's unbelief. And because of unbelief, God was not well pleased with most of them. So you're either taking this admonishment here or in 2 Corinthians 2.11, you're getting sucked into this. For such are as false apostles, deceitful workers, 
transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. But no marvel. Why are you surprised, believer? Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So this is no big thing. It's no great thing if his ministers, people who are controlled by demon spirits, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works, which we just read is destruction. They will be destroyed and all those who follow with them. As hard as it is for people to get their head around it, right now, in most churches, this is what's going on. It's doctrine of demons that's going out in the name of Jesus. These ministers of light. Who probably, within the congregation, is preaching 90% truth. Absolute truth. Because the truth is the hook. And then when you see all kinds of mighty good works, well, they just can't be going astray. And so you tell yourself this. Well, no. You know, it's just... I've seen it with my own eyes. Well, we're going to see how Solomon began in a humble beginning. A very humble beginning. And what happened? Even with the teachings of his mom. So, looking back is not acceptable. Forget what was behind, positive or negative, no matter what it was in your life or what you did, forget. See, if you can't forget it, there again, you're making a mockery of grace. You're saying, I can't forget that this is more powerful than God's grace. Every time that you say that, that's what you're saying. I don't care how bad it was. I'm sure there's some, some bad things, but present company, I don't think that anybody in here, unless they say something about you I don't know, uh, purposely killed followers of Christ before your conversion. So, God used Paul to write some pretty strong words because he was qualified to write them. So it doesn't matter. The only reason you're hanging out in that campground is because you really don't want full maturity in Christ. It's, it's just comfortable to sing Jesus loves me. Because dying and overcoming is hard. It's much better being in kids church. Because they give out candy and all kinds of stuff. So you have to make the decision like every believer does. And remember what Christ overcame in the garden. Such is this generation. Proverbs 31. Now this, I'm sure there's a... <clears throat> A lot of other sermons today that's going to look at Proverbs 31 because of the title of Mothers. But we're not going to look at that part of Proverbs 31. We're going to look at the part that's very seldom looked at. The first nine verses. Because what's generally preached on is after verse 9. So we're going to begin this journey. The words of King Lemuel. This is Solomon. 
It's another name for Solomon. The prophecy that his mother taught him. So obviously right here in one little ditty of scripture, what do we understand about Bathsheba that she understood? And she understood the life that was intended for her son. So obviously, this doesn't say that his father, David, taught him. It doesn't mean that David didn't teach him things, but... Society as a whole, then and now, time-wise, who spends most time with the child, generally? Moms. Moms. So they have a huge influence on their children, positive or negative. Positive or negative. Bad habits, good habits. Now, she says in verse 2, Watch my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. So as far as her mindset was, when was Solomon given over to God? Before he was even born. Yeah. And out of all the things, all the things, she says, first rattle out of the box, give not your strength unto women. Wow. 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 Now, in today's feminine society, uh, what I'm fixing to say is probably going to offend a bunch of women. Those who hear it anyway. <clears throat> but the unredeemed lady, the unchanged lady, the old Man, woman, <laughs> the greatest thing for her to overcome is deception. Because that's what you inherited from Eve. This is why now pretty much the whole United States government, local, national, every bit of it is run by who? Women. There's more women in authoritative offices making authoritative decisions in the running of state, local, and national things than's ever been in the United States history. And that's a curse, by the way. It's not liberation. Because God told Israel. Part of, the, part of your downfall is going to be your women will rule over you. And the detrimental part about that is because of women's propensity to be deceived with things. Because they actually believe their deception. You, you can't convince them otherwise. That's, what, that's how powerful deception is. So she's telling him, don't give your strength into women. This power of deception will consume you. And we have that picture with Adam and Eve. The Bible confirms that Eve was deceived. Adam saw it right with his eyes wide open and said, oh, okay. He just did it.
So today, women for the most part sin through deception. Guys sin with their eyes wide open. They know it's wrong. Go ahead and do it anyway. Somehow or another, grace will cover it. I don't really know, but that's what I've heard all my life. So don't give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, back to teachings of weeks ago, kings and priests. So should you know what destroys kings? Is it important to you to know what destroys kings? Just as much as it should be of interest to you, what's a priest? Well, turn it over to Deuteronomy 17. Sadly, every one of these elements Solomon violated. We'll look first at his fall, and then we'll see his very humble beginning. Verse 14, Deuteronomy 17. When you are come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it, and you dwell there, and say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me, you will in any wise set a king over you to whom the Lord your God shall choose. So be one from among your brethren who you will set king over you and you may not set a stranger over you which is not your brother. But he will not multiply here's one thing a king does not do does not multiply horses to himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you you will henceforth no more go that way. So from the day that you decided to come under covenant with God through Christ, <clears throat> Egypt was no longer an option. Now, if you know anything, we'll just look at some of Israel's history, but if you turn over to Jeremiah 37, if you want to hold your finger... There, that's fine. Yeah. Jeremiah 37. This is one situation where things began to look kind of bad for Jeremiah because it actually looked like what the false prophets had been teaching them was actually going to come true and Jeremiah's words were false. So we pick it up at verse 5. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt. And when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. See here again, it seems like these predictions by the false were correct because their message was opposite of Jeremiah's. And as often is the case, there always seems to be a short time period where it looks like the false is right. Because I totally believe that this is a process of God separating chaff and wheat. Those who truly believe his word and know it and those that don't. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city. They will take it and they will burn it with fire. 
Thus says the Lord, deceive not yourselves. In other words, I said what I said and I stand by it. I don't care if circumstances have a perception that something else is going to take place. Don't deceive yourself saying the Chaldeans will surely depart from us for they will not depart. Bible prophecy will fulfill itself and it will not depart. It will not depart. No matter how much slobber preachers want to get behind the pulpit and just rave and rave and rave and rave over this tremendous revival that's going to take place prior to the rapture of the church, no matter how much they want that, it's a deception that is destroying people because people are not, I've heard people say it. They're looking at that sign as, well, when I see that revival, I'll really get ready. And since it's not going to be, it's never going to happen, so you're going to get caught unaware. Again, fulfilling Bible prophecy. God even underscores His words. For though you had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and the only thing out of the entire army remains but wounded men among them, yet these will rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. Now, he doesn't say it here, thus says the Lord, but it's implied. I'm God. I'm in charge. Man might be able to halfway explain the weather, but I'm in charge. And my words will be fulfilled. So, You don't cause the people to return to Egypt. You don't cause people as a king, you don't cause your own sufficiency of support. You don't cause somebody else to stumble because of your looking at a sufficiency of support within yourself to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Your advice to somebody is, well, greater is he who's in me than one's in the world. And that same opportunity is afforded to you. Now, if you want to get beyond this, then you're going to have to overcome this. The only way that you're going to overcome this is by what Christ did 2,000 years ago. And when you look and believe at that, at the victory won there, and that that grace is sufficient, then you'll understand that it's through that power for you to overcome, and you're not going to get there any other way. Right now, your house is burning down. And I'm telling you, it's burning it down. And you know deep inside of you that that's the greatest act of love that you can extend towards somebody. Because you may not have another opportunity to say that. Today is the day of salvation. You don't get tomorrow. No guarantee for it. So you're not in any way, any way to call somebody to want to return to Egypt. Return to some other support system. Not in any way. And see, under the New Covenant, you can do that by planting a thought in somebody's mind. Wow. If you can look and lust, 
be guilty of adultery. There's things today that you can be guilty of murder over and never pick up a knife. Because you're more accountable. You will no way return that way anymore. Neither will you multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. See, today the church has many brides. To which is following the propensity of a woman to fall prey to deception. And again, see, I am talking about fallen woman. Fallen woman or fallen man. What happened at the cross gives you the ability to put every bit of that behind you. To where you should no longer be deceived. Multiply all of these doctrines to yourself. Because what's the byproduct? They will turn your heart away. Why? Because you go to church week after week, month after month, year after year, and you hear the same thing spoken in your ears. So if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, you bored? Guess how deception comes? You hear it over and 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 over. You can't, you can't explain where it's at in here. You just heard it so much that you just know it's there. You never looked it up. You never searched the scriptures to see that which was being said was so. Because it was a man of great prominence or whoever it was that uh, was obviously trustworthy that And he will greatly multiply, and neither will he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Now, if you turn to Second Chronicles chapter ten, you'll see where Solomon violated this as well through heavy taxation of the people. And Rehoboam went to Shechem. For to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. Jerusalem was where he placed his name, but guess where he went? Shechem. And it came to pass when Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whether he had fled, whether he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt, and they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease you somewhat the grievous servitude of your father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, which this is heavy taxes required, and we'll serve you. And he said unto them, Come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel do you give me to return this answer to the people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel which was of the old men that gave him, and he took counsel with the young guys, who were brought up with him. Because see, after all, the younger generation is always more hip than the old. Boy, some things haven't changed. What advice? 
do you give that we may return the answer to this people which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that your father did put on us. And the young men who were brought up with him spoke unto him, saying, This kind of, this morning when I was rereading this, kind of reminded me of the Bernie Sanders crowd that I've seen on the news feeds. Somebody got to pay for all that stuff. And the young man who were brought up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you will answer the people who spoke unto you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but, but make you it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger will be thicker than my father's loins, for whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I'll put more of a yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but my yoke's going to be like scorpions. So they just increased the taxation. Here we are. <clears throat> now, one of the things while we're right here at it, uh, now I said some comments uh, in this Bible are on target and some are so off. I have no idea <coughs> how they get that far other than this total deception and wanting to believe something so bad that truth just isn't seen. Uh, still in Second Chronicles 10. The conclusion of the ninth chapter, he has written in here, well, this 28, 28 and 29, his last verses. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt, out of all the lands. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, the prophecy of Agi, the Solomite, the visions of Iddo, the seer, against Jeremiah, the son of Nebet. And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel forty years, and Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David, his father. Now he has a note down here. The fact that God did not record the great sins of Solomon in his latter years is indication that Solomon asked for and received mercy, forgiveness, and grace. Thereby his sins washed away and not recorded. Well, turn over to 1 Kings. Chapter 11. Let's see if that's true. God did not record Solomon's great sins in his latter years. Indication that he repented. Chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You will not go into them, neither will you come, they come into you. For surely they will turn your heart away after their gods. And Solomon claved unto these in love. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, a thousand total. So he had a thousand different altars. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old. Would you classify that as latter years? Since he died around 60, he died relatively young. That his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after the Ashtoreth the goddess of the Zidonians, and Malcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. 
And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord. Modern church. Went not fully. Then did Solomon build a high place for Kamosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his thousand wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And it commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. So there's no other reason why this commentary would be in here other than deception. None. That's why you, you, you get a Bible that's got commentary in it, you better be very careful. Very careful. It, it could be on target, and then maybe not. And I, to this day, in any kind of reference to Solomon losing his soul, it's just been a gasp from other believers. Not so. How can you say such a thing? I didn't say it. The Bible says it. No idolater will enter in. He started awesomely well. You know, his mom taught him well. The greatest advice that she could give him. Stay away from strange women. It's not for kings, back at Proverbs 31, <coughs> it is not for kings, O Lemuel, O Solomon. It is not for kings to drink wine, i.e., in excess, nor for princes strong drink. <coughs> Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Now, Revelation refers to cups of adultery, which has a symbolism of wine. So that would be perverted truth. So here, it's not to drink strong wine, so it can be spiritual and natural. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Not drunk with wine, we're in his excess. Lest they drink, forget the law, and pervert judgment. They pervert the word of God. See, when you don't speak the truth in love, you're literally perverting the judgment of God in somebody who is under affliction. I don't care whether they acknowledge they're under affliction. It doesn't matter. Anybody can put on a smiley face for an hour every Sunday morning. You just can't. But the one you give strong drink to is the one that's already sentenced to die. I totally believe this probably in early years of our country, this is where things, people who was to be executed or something that had a sentence of what they did prior to them. This is what that stuff is for. Because their verdict has already been passed. It's just a matter of time. So just give them a little bit of ease by giving them a strong drink. And wine unto those who be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. 
Open your mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Again, narrow is the path that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. So, somebody who is walking a wide path is in a path, what? That path is appointed to destruction. And out of all the giftings within the body of Christ, of these in the giftings that every man has gotten, it, whether you're lost or saved, the mercy or compassion individual should be the ones rising up ahead of anybody telling somebody your house is burning down. But they're the most silent. Why? Because you hadn't forgot. Living in the past is unacceptable. <clears throat> you haven't moved on to the victory that's in Christ. You know it's there, but you don't have it, so it's because you just don't believe it. And you will speak the truth in love. You don't have to, you don't have to fake force emotion. When, when you know that you know that you know that you know your house is burning down, and this may be my last opportunity to tell you anything. It's a copy that flows out because it's a fruit of the Spirit. And you won't let somebody continually, they may still choose the path of destruction. But unless you want to join them, you better watch and you better warn. <clears throat> 